may be seated. 10,000 reasons why we bless the Lord this morning. One of them is I'm here. I know you have blessings also. Send this with you. Birthday girl today, Miss Sylvia Cooper, and 
and start working. She's 39 today. And um, somebody said again. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Happy birthday, Miss Sylvie. Um, one of the things that, are you excited about today? Are you excited about tonight? What happens tonight? Amen? I was talking about the Colossians chapter 3 study where we're having at 5.30. Is there something else going on tonight? I think there is There is some football game. I don't know. But at 5.30 tonight, we will still be having service. You know, I'll make sure we're, you know. Won't try to go too long, but we're, we're looking at the book of Colossians, so uh, join with us to enjoy that, right, Ricky? <laughs> I wouldn't call somebody out, ever, <laughs> but uh, we, we do want to have <laughs> I'm so sorry. But anyway, <laughs> you're not here, I'll call you out next time. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we do want to have a good time. This is our family. It's our family, and if you ever sit around a, a, a good family dinner table, you can have some great talks. I mean, you can have some of those times where you just get to feel feel things and share things with each other that you didn't even know that you could talk about openly. And sometimes those family dinners are that way. Sometimes they're they're, they're difficult. Sometimes, as, as my dad said, they were the they were the coming to Jesus time in front of the whole family while they got to watch you get reprimanded. And sometimes that's what our family is. But I tell you what, the family of God's that way. What we desire today to, is to not only worship uh, our Lord and our Savior today, we, exalt, we, we desire to uh, exalt Him, but we also desire to know each other and live life with one another. And that means laughing, that means crying when we cry, that means seeking Him in all the things that we do. That's what our prayer is today. Let me pray for us. Father Lord, I, I do pray for today. I pray for our service. Father, I, prepare, I pray that you will prepare our hearts right now for what you want to show us what you want to reveal to us. Father, we know that your word is powerful. And Father, we just pray right now that you speak through your word. But we also pray that as we, as we sing songs of praise and adoration and exaltation to you, Father, we pray that every word that is spoken, Father, is not just a word that we sing or we read off of a screen, but Father, it's a, it's a heartfelt cry that we have. And Father, we just pray right now for, for our, our own hearts. Father, we pray that as we read those words on the screen, as we, as, as we sing, Father, we pray that we're true to those words. Father, I just ask for forgiveness for, for so many times where I sing of your, uh, your 10,000 reasons to praise you, and yet I sing of them with my voice and ear, but my heart says, I'm tired. Father, where, where my, my, my voice says that you are worthy, you alone Take away my sins. Where my, my, my voice says that I desire to exalt you forever and ever. But Father, in my heart, I just want to get through the day and don't want anything else. Father, forgive me. Forgive us. Father, let us be authentic today. Let us be people who can truly, when we say something, we mean it. Father, help us today. Help us as we go into your word. Father, I pray for this last week, Father, those who are dealing with difficult loss, we, 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 we uh, just pray for the DeWitt family this week, Father, for their loss. Father, we pray for those that are dealing with sicknesses and illnesses and family members and their own personal lives and going in and out of hospitals. Father, we just pray for your grace to be sufficient. Father, we pray that we feel your just warm embrace around us as your children. But Father, I just pray for right now prepare our hearts. It's in your gracious and mighty name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. If the seats one of you here this morning, as Brother Scott was saying, we're going to take a few moments and let you have an opportunity to fellowship. Let's stand together as the instruments play. Hug somebody's neck, shake somebody's hand. It's good to be in the
smile when he gets off there, I just know, man, he, it's going to come back to me now. <laughs> I know him too well. Amen. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord today, church? Amen. 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 We're going to be, you can go ahead and start turning your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. We're going to be going through for the next four weeks something uh, looking at fear and actually having a freedom from fear is our desire is that we will have to be free of fear. Today I want to speak on something that, that paralyzes Christians today. It, I want to speak on something that robs us of joy and it robs us of peace. Speak of something that plagues us like an incurable disease that we can't shake and can't get rid of. And so I want to spend these next four weeks addressing fear. I want to see that fear is something, whether we admit it or not, is a daily part of our life. It's a daily part of our struggles uh, as Christians to live in the joy of our salvation. And that fear cripples us. It actually handicaps us for the kingdom of God. It 
handicaps us from that peace and that joy and living the fruit of the Spirit that we're called to live in every day. Fear. And it's honestly, it's, not, it's one of those things that we don't think about often when we think about things stopping us from, from living this Christian life. Because we, we think of fear as something being from the boogeyman or some bad guy chasing you. But there's, the reality is fear is a lot more than that. Fear is, is actually in every part of our, our decisions and our decision-making process. And we're going to be looking at that. For many of us, we, we struggle with the fear of man. And the fear of man, and I, like I said, that, that fear of man is not the struggle or the scare of having some big guy chase you, although I am kind of worried about Ricky now, but you never know. It's, that's not exactly what fear of man I'm talking about. That fear of man is, 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 that, is a fear that drives our thoughts and actions. And it's when, it's when you remember being in elementary school, high school, it's what made you wear certain types of clothes. It's what made you uh, listen to certain types of music. That fear of man is what made you like certain sports. That fear of man is what made you drink certain things that you probably knew you shouldn't have drank. We talk about his peer pressure, but the reality is it is a fear of man. It's a fear of being rejected. A fear of not fitting in. A fear of, of for whatever reason, you being different than everyone else and fearing that difference and fearing what would it be like for me not to be like everyone else and that Fear that drives you. We fear that as kids. And, and I wish it was just a kid problem. I wish we could say, praise God, we've all, thankfully just with age, we've grown up. So we don't have to worry about the fear of that. We don't, we don't do that to fit in anymore. We don't have that fear of man anymore. We don't, we don't try to, we don't struggle that way, but that's a lie. And as adults, it, it, it clouds what cars we buy. What houses we choose to live in. It even, it even clouds things like whether I should let my kids be involved in this sport or that sport, because what would happen if every all these other kids are doing it? What would they think of me as a parent if I don't want to let my kids do it? Or even vacations. We talked about this in our Sunday school class. I mean, everybody goes, everybody goes to Disney World. What kind of parent would I be if I don't send my kids to Disney World? We really can't afford it, so we'll go in debt and we'll, we'll, we'll end up trying to climb out of a hole for the next 20 years trying to do this. But fear. Fear of man, fear of perceptions, fear of other people's thoughts, it drives your life. It's one of the biggest fears that we struggle with. Even as senior adults, uh, it, it acts as a fear to stay active in certain clubs and, and go to certain events. Because what would people think if you weren't there? What would they really do? Fear. Church, the fear of man is one of the greatest struggles we have in our congregation. And it affects every single one of us, from our children sitting in that seat to our oldest senior adult. That affects every one of us. And you don't have to try to figure out who that oldest senior adult is. All of us are affected. Church of Fear of Man is that great struggle in our congregation. Um, well, we're going to spend some more time during these, these next few weeks going over specifically that one because, honestly, a lot of our, of our struggles are trying to keep up with our neighbors I would say Joneses, but I've already kind of picked on Ricky once. I don't know. We've done that again. But we're keeping up with our neighbors. You know, so, and so what do we do? Fear of man says, well, they got this. I mean, I didn't get that. Or, you know, they're wearing these type of clothes. I didn't wear these types of clothes. They're doing this. I probably need to do this. I just don't want to. I don't want to seem like I'm uneducated. I don't want to seem like I'm, I'm poor. I don't want to seem like I'm this or that. Because you're worried about what everyone else thinks. That's fear of man. Um, we're going to get to that day. We're going to spend an entire day on fear of man. Let me just tell you, it comes from really one thing. It, it comes from you believing that man is big and God is small. That's where fear of man comes from. That's where the desire to please everyone else in all these things, from the clothes to the, our speech to the music we listen to, to what we drive, to where we live, to everything about us, the education that you have in order to impress, it all comes down to one root thing is that you think, we think, that man is big and God is little and therefore we fear man more than what we fear. So we're going to get to that, but that fear of man is one of those, those fears that we're going to go over in these next few weeks. It's a fear that we all struggle with. But there's also other, other fears that we're going to look at. One of those being the, uh, uh, one of those struggles being the fear of death. It's a valid fear. We know that it's been one that's held for centuries. It's a fear that 
uh, that maybe you haven't lived up to your end of the bargain and you fear not re actually receiving eternal life or going into heaven. Maybe it's a fear that death itself will be painful. <laughs> maybe it's a fear that maybe you've gotten everything in your life wrong. You ever woke up that way? I have. And I have. I mean, I, I, I don't... I can't remember a day in the last probably 10 years where I haven't had a daily devotion time, but I can still tell you why I've woken up and gone, I can't get it all wrong. Now, praise God. He's gracious and large enough. And his shoulders are wide enough to take puny little Scott Bird's doubts and shoulder them and carry me to the next day and go, I told you. Praise God, He is. But still, that fear is there. That fear of what it is. What's tomorrow? What if I've got it all wrong? What if I what if I've devoted my whole life to this thing? What if you know we my, I, you know my income where I where I went to work at is even determined by this belief I have? How I raise my children? What I do and don't do every day? What I or allow myself to participate in that everybody else says is fun that I've never even tried? What if it's all wrong? God? What if at the end I find out I just got it all wrong? What if I found out I, I just believe the whole wrong thing? Fear of death. Fear of that being wrong, man. Fear of those that you're, you're, that you're leaving behind. Twofold. Fear of death involves fear of those you're leaving behind. One, maybe they won't be taken care of, so it's doubting the providence of God. Or maybe it's just doubting the fact that you prepared to love. Or two, sometimes that fear of death is just really being fearful that you won't ever be remembered again. <coughs> so we, we are people who want a legacy. I mean, we have... Entire presidents who write books trying to create this legacy of themselves, and it's not just a presidential ego thing, it is us. We want to direct people's thoughts about us later on, even after we're gone. So a lot of that fear of death is us just being scared to death that no one will even remember we existed. Let me just tell you, they won't. I'm going in that one. Most of us don't in this room don't know our great, great, great grandparents' names. We're related. We owe our existence to them, at least in some sense. We're not. Fear, uh, fear that death, fear that your loved ones won't be taken care of. Even, even that fear of death that leads to every single doctor visit or lack of a doctor visit, even though you should be going as a good stewardship to this body, this earthen vessel God's given you. So taking care of, care of it and getting it checked up and seeing there's anything you can do to live healthier for the glory of God for as long as he desires to keep you here. You fear going to the doctor because what if he finds that dreaded C word? Cancer. Fear of death. So you schedule your days around these doctor's appointments and your fear and your worry, your anxiety to get to that point. Fear and it drives us. It's a struggle that we have. But that's not the only struggle. For some of us, it's just that fear of the unknown. Just the fear of the unknown. Some of you, including me, lose hours and hours and hours of sleep thinking about things that we don't know what's going to happen. And we can't change it. We can't do it. We can't do anything. But it's a fear. What if this happens, God? What if this happens? Or what if that happens? Fear of that unknown. Fear that everything would just fall apart tomorrow. That all the work, all the effort, all the direction, all the striving, all the prayers, all that's just for nothing. It's just going to fall apart. What, what happens tomorrow if this happens? Fear. Fear that unknown. Matter of fact, this week, uh, we all we have Netflix. We don't have Digiturk. Or our Digiturk, that's, that's in Turkey. Uh, uh, whatever the satellite is that you have here. We don't have it, of course, as you can tell. But we watch Netflix and yeah, so you you can only watch so many things on Netflix. And so usually things go to Netflix after they've already been worn out everywhere else. And so one of the things on Netflix we started watching with the kids is this show called Doomsday Castle. It's a bunch of these rednecks in South Carolina, and it could be here, but it's just they have heels, so it's not here. But it's the rednecks that decide the end of the world's coming soon. They build this big castle, and they, they got the he has ten kids, and six of them show up, and they're going to learn how to. to to, to finish this castle out and defend themselves for the end of times that is coming. Think about this guy and his whole family's life. 
Fear of what is next or what, what could happen. The, the crash of America, and the, the, his EMP that could go off in the, the atmosphere, a nuclear bomb that could go off in the atmosphere that would create an electromagnetic <laughs> pulse and no electricity. What would we do? And man, he is going through this elaborate scenario and he spent thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars building this thing that looks like a medieval castle in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere for that day. Fear of the unknown has driven his whole life. And before I make too much fun of him, I need to look at mine. Look at what the fear of the unknown has done to me. What it has driven me to do. Save instead of sometimes give where I probably should have been on eating to give. Fear of that unknown. It, it wreaks havoc on our lives. Fear that we won't be able to handle tomorrow. God, this is hard enough today. What if something else comes? You're just going to break my back. You're just going to be a straw that broke the camel's back, and I just won't be able to take it. And it's this fear that something tomorrow is just going to fall. I won't be able to take it. Fear. Fear. Fear of what we don't know. Church, this is not the way God desires us to live. Amen. We're not to live in this fear. We're not to be bound by the shackle that Satan and this world would tie us to. It would, it would have you be so petrified with fear that you would not <coughs> believe for the kingdom of God. It would have you be so petrified. And, and, and scared in this fear, that what would you do? You would just follow the rest of the lemmings of the world and do what they do. Because it's safer in a herd. That's not what God desires to live. We should live in the joy and the peace of God. Amen. That's what we are to live in. And this fear is killing us. It's robbing our church. It's robbing you and your life. I think it's robbing us of seeing some of the, the blessings of what God could do here. We would let go and let him. So today I want to lay a, a foundation for a freedom from fear. So we're going to go through four weeks of a freedom from fear. So I'll spend the, today we'll lay that foundation. In the next three weeks we'll address three different fear issues. That first one being the fear of man that we talked about. The second one being that fear of death. And that third one being the fear of the unknown. So today we're going to lay that foundation. So let's dive right in with the text today. I'm going to ask you to stand in the honor of reading of God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 1. That's what we're looking at. 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 6. We're going to go all the way down to verse 12. For this reason, I remind you, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, to, uh, to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to be a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus, before the ages began, and which now has begun manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day. What has been entrusted to me. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray for, I pray for your power. I pray for your, your ability. I pray for your strength and your love and your self-discipline in our lives right now as we study your word. Father, we pray that we see that your word is directly applicable to our lives. It is not some random random book written 2,000 years ago that we can study just for history. But Father, you're speaking and you're cutting right to our hearts today. Father, we just pray that as we look at this, as we look at fear, Father, I pray that with, with every, each and every verse, with each and every point, with each and every, every uh, detail that's brought out, I pray you bring out a fear, Father, that we're bowing down to. Father, I pray for my own life, for that fear of acceptance that I bow down to, for, the, for that fear, uh, Father, that fear of being someone who's important that, that I bow down to, that fear of all those things like that, Father, all the ones that we have, 
Father, I pray you bring those out. Father, I pray it's like a well right now that as your, your spirit teaches us and guides us as we walk through your word, I pray that it begins to bubble up, Father. Father, because then we can see those fears exposed and we can bring them to the foot of the cross. And then we can live in the peace and joy that you would have. So, Father, I pray that, that, that your word dissects us right now. Pick apart. Father, loosen the justifications that we have for doing what we do. Father, we are not justified before you. Only through the blood of Christ are we justified before you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Like I said, we want to be going through fear. These words were actually given to uh, that the young minister Timothy by Paul, uh, a mentor, uh, uh, someone who to guide him in his his new new role as new shepherding, new church planning, new new uh, new uh, role as a leading those in the church. And we, but we see also that this, even though this was written to Timothy, it isn't just to Timothy; it's to us as well. So we got to be careful always when we look and talk about that hermeneutical triangle, that interpretation. What did it mean to the original people? What is the main message, and what does it mean to us? I think what we're going to try to hit at is some of that main meaning, and then we'll be able to apply it to us. But this is applicable to us. We, like Timothy, live in fear, and it drives us to do some things. That's what we're going to look at today. The first thing I want us to see is actually found in verse 7. It's that the first thing I want us to see is that fear should not rule us, but instead we should have power, love, and self-discipline. That fear should not rule us, but we should have power, love, and self-discipline, self-control, however you want to name that. That's in verse 7. Let me read verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Did you see how that verse 7 starts off there? It doesn't say, the pastor gave you something. It doesn't say, come into church enough, Timothy, will give these people something. It doesn't say, you being around, around me, Timothy, enough, I, you'll get this. It doesn't say, uh, doing the right things will get you this. It says, God gave he starts off this talk about fear, this talk about not being ashamed, this talk about power and love and self-control with the only place you can go to say you did nothing, God did. So as we begin to look at how do we overcome fear in our lives, how do we, how do we step out, how do we be people who, who don't want to fall to the pressures of this world, we, what do we do? We say God does it. As we speak of this spirit that was not afraid, that gives us to be not afraid, we're reminded that we didn't do it. God did it. God did this for us. God, not you, earned this fearlessness of the spirit. God, not you, will keep it for yourself. God, not you, will give you freedom from fear. God will. God has given you everything you need in this life in him. That's the thing that I always have difficulty with um, some of our understanding of the term sanctification, which we talked about that when we were looking at the will of God. It's the will of God that you be sanctified. Remember we talked about that in Timothy uh, as well. And so, uh, yeah, Timothy or Thessalonians, I'm lost now. But when we looked at that, that, that it's God's will that you be sanctified. Remember we said that? And that's to be more like Jesus to uh, tomorrow than you are today. Every day, get closer and closer to being matured in the likeness of Jesus. God desires you to be sanctified. But a lot of us, we still feel like that means we must start with kindergarten level, and then we move up, we get to graduate high school, and we go to college. God has given you everything that you need to live this life from the second you become a follower of Jesus Christ. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. If he, he's, he's, he has uh, brought you into a community when he has saved you, he's given you wise counsel, he's given you his word. You have everything that you need. God will keep you, and he will, he will give you that freedom. That freedom. You're not missing anything. Do not let Satan or the world tell you any different. God has given it to you. Take that to the bank. It says that God gave us a spirit not of fear. That spirit of fear is actually a timid or a cowardly or a shameful fear. It's only used here in the New Testament, and it carries a, a, an extremely negative meaning. But look at what God did give us. He gave us a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. That power speaks of a great force or energy 
And where we, it's where we get the term dynamic or dynamite. That's that same, that's where that, that word comes from. That's the power we get. That explosive power, that small thing that when, when used the right way can create some massive destruction or it can also be some great good. That's the power he's given you. Not a fear, but one that can drive things out, that can break free a lot of, a lot of the chains that you're under. That power speaks of an effective, a productive energy, not just some raw or untamed force. So it's not, it's not as if it's just something that's randomly taking place. It's just a, a great instance of power over here. It's a controlled, tamed, bridled, used force. That's what God's given us. That's the power he is speaking of here. God gives us this power to do one thing. It's to accomplish his purposes. This is why he wants us to have it. Because he didn't give you this power so that you could pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and earn a, earn a decent living and, make, and, and, uh, and be successful in the eyes of your neighbors. He didn't do that for that reason. He did it so that you could accomplish his purposes, which is to glorify him and exalt him forever and ever. And that's why he wants you to have it. This is what Paul spoke of in Ephesians 3.20. He said, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Why can we do all those things? He's in us. And when we're doing His will, He's going to equip us for that. This, that love, so we all have, not only do we have the power, we have this love, and that's from the agape form of love of God. It's a selfless love that describes, that, that, that desires the, the works, desires and works for the best interest of the ones that are loved. It's not an emotional or conditional or even a sensual or a selfish love. It is. That's one of the things I think we, have, we as, as humans have the most difficulty understanding is God's constant love. So he did not give us the spirit of fear, but he gave us the spirit of power, this, this bridled, entained um, uh, 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 use of this uh, explosive power. He gave us that. Then he gave us this understanding of love. Love for him, not like us. Not this, No matter who we are, we still, we're still selfish in our love. No matter how much you love your spouse, the reality is all of us could only do it for so long if we felt that they didn't love us back. Why? Because even our best attempts at love are still selfish. <coughs> There's still something we want out of it. That's not the love of Christ, though. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 goes on and on about. It's not about what you get in return. That's, that's, and that love is also what we can't understand even in our own relation to our own sin. Because we don't love that way, we also think we have to earn the love of God. It's the reason I made the statement over and over, and I try to drill it into our heads. Our, not just yours, my head. There's nothing I can do. If, if I'm a child of God today, there's nothing I can do to make Jesus love me more or less. If I walk out of these doors, and, and, God, and God uses me to bring great revival to our city, He loves me. If I walk out of these doors, and I fail, in my marriage vows. God loves me just as much. Why? Because his love isn't emotional. It isn't selfish. It is constant. And you know the fact is, he started loving me knowing that I would be dead. That's the love that we have in Christ. And it's one of the things that we're supposed to live in, not fear. Live in the power. Live in the love that he has. That's not any selfish. It's self-discipline. Uh, it literally means secure and sound in mind. It carries the idea of a self-controlled and properly organized mind. And if you've ever had one of those times where, when you're when you're really afraid, if, you ever, if you've ever really been afraid, you that's the last thing you have. I mean, you don't know what to do, how to do it. You don't know which way to run, which way to go. And you end up making some horribly bad mistakes. It's also the reason when, if, you, if you run up behind somebody, which I've always heard, I kind of told him this, and now I don't like that I told him this, about scaring Rebecca. I don't mind scaring Rebecca. I just don't want him doing it to me. You know, like, hide behind the, hide behind the door and they jump out. Because, you know, when, what happens, right? And I know some of you, some of you know what I'm saying here. Um, when they jump out, they scare you. Your mind's not really there. So what happens when your mind's not thinking? Well, you may say some things you should not have said, right? Because your mind's not in control. Your flesh is. 
And so that it's kind of like you, you want to find out how clean a man's living and how clean his speech is, let him hit his, his, uh, let him hit his uh, um, thumb with a hammer when he's, when he's grooming or something. You find out what's really there, right? Or you scare him and you see what he said. That's what's there. Self-discipline, that controlled mind. John MacArthur says that, that a disciplined life is the divinely ordered life in which godly wisdom is applied to every situation. Every situation. So God has given us a, a, not a, a, a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, the ability to know that we have unbelievable strength and we can, we can harness this, uh, 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 the understanding that God is in control of all things. We can do that. Not only that, we have this love of Christ that helps us not to fear what is to come, but we also have a self-discipline to know, I need to apply what I know of God here and here. The opposite of fear. This is what we're to have, not fear. Love, but power, love, and discipline. Let's keep moving forward in this passage and see the text reveals three things that fear brings. It, bring, it tells us three different things that fear brings. And that, that first one is found in verse 8, and that's that fear brings shame. That fear brings shame. Look at verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me as his prisoner, but share in his suffering of the gospel by the power of God. Fear allows us to move things of priority off. It's kind of like, you know, that, you know, when you think of the, like a pyramid, the, the top thing being the most important, I always think of the food pyramid. I don't know why. I guess they did that while I was a kid. I never agreed with the food pyramid. It was always like the grossest stuff. It was always at the top of it. Candies and things should be at the very top. But um, the food pyramid or any pyramid, you have the most important thing at the very top, right? Well, what fear does is it, it moves, it reprioritizes what things should be. So fear says man is up here, God is up here, and all in between is this variation of some things are important for God, some things aren't. Some things I should really try to do, some things are really doesn't matter. It's not that big a deal. And so it's, it moves these priorities, and because of it, when we get in a situation where that top thing is not the top thing for everybody else, it moves down and we become shame. We no longer take stands for Christ because fear stops us and we begin to be shamed away from him. The shame is of the Lord here that he's speaking of. It's no longer he that's our top priority. It's no longer your life is no longer centered around the audience of one, but it's centered around you and your desires and your wants and ultimately the fear that drives you in every aspect. Shame now creeps in. Shame as it's related to Christ. This is the opposite of what, the, what we actually see in the Bible. Look at uh, Psalm 40, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 40, verses 9 and 10 tells us, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord. You know I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken, your, I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth. From the great congregation. And then look at Psalm 119, 46. Once again, this fear, this shame that's brought through fear is the opposite of what the Bible calls for us. Psalm 119, 46 says, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. Those who live by the power of the Lord, those who live by the love of the Lord, and those who live by the, the self-control of the Lord are not ashamed. Fear makes us stand down and retreat. Fear makes us ashamed of the Lord. But think about how this shame actually plays out in our lives. Because we care so much about what others think and fear them looking down on us, we watch things we don't and shouldn't watch. Why? Because everybody else does it. Who am I going to be if everyone else understands these conversations and I don't? I'm the weird guy. It makes us say things that we probably know we shouldn't say. And a lot of times this comes out in the but actually I would say not even saying as much as a little laughter. Because you know as a Christian we, most of us feel pretty guilty and pretty uh, 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 convicted about telling dirty jokes or inappropriate jokes of any kind. But let me tell you what Christians are not good at. They're not good at when they're being told to you saying, man I just don't want to hear that. Dude. Here's what we try to do. We try not to laugh too loud because we don't want to be of the world. But we try to, we still want to kind of, we kind of snicker. Because <laughs> we don't want to be the complete weirdo. 
Because you're the weirdo if you go, man, I still want to hear that bit. Just, can you just, I don't know what I'm saying, don't want any part of that. Shame. It also comes down when we don't share with our neighbors because we don't want, we don't want them to think we're one of those Jesus freaks. Because see, it's, in America, everyone can have their own personal religious beliefs. You can believe whatever you want inside their house. But the second you cross over that yard and you begin knocking on their door and you share it and, you, and it begins to live out in your life, man, you're one of those weirdos. You're actually, it's, it's the whole thing, uh, probably many of you have heard David Platt. And he wrote a book called Radical. Great book, horrible title. <coughs> horrible title. You know why? Because he, he, he talks about this, this obedient life to Jesus being radical. No, that should be called Christian. Norm. Average. The bare what God has called already minimum in your life. But yet when we, we as these Americans, we read that book, we look at that, and there's, no, there's only one word that can summarize a life like that. Radical. Radical. Why? Because we have been so, we are so fearful of man, and so fearful of what they think of us. That man, they're just those people are different. They're different. Fear makes us live lives of shame. Fear of what really matters. That shame of brings uh, uh, a shame of what really matters in life. Shame of our Lord. But that's not all that fear brings. The second thing I, the, that I want us to see is that that uh, fear brings a, a a want of comfort and ease. What's another thing that fear brings? It, it brings a want of comfort and ease. Look at verse eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, but. Uh, nor of me as his prisoner, but sharing his suffering of the power of the Lord. Fear makes us run from suffering. It puts us in the mindset to look for the easiest way out. When this letter was written in about 66 AD, uh, Christians, uh, to be, say yourself, uh, call yourself a Christian was not an easy task. You didn't just receive criticism or were labeled as a Jesus freak. You were actually persecuted in prison and even possibly put to death. That's the audience that falls uh, Paul's sharing when he talks to Timothy about this. That's, that's what's going on. Fear leads us actually to fit in. It makes us not want to stand out. It makes us not want to be different. We do this because being different is uncomfortable. And we want to be comfortable. We want to have a life of ease. How dare we have to, how dare I have to justify these difficult biblical beliefs to a world that thinks the opposite of them? Man. It's like you can, you can phrase things in a way um, that, that you still love people, but you can't condemn homosexuality anymore. Because if you do, it's taking a stand that's uncomfortable. Why? Because everyone else wants to make them feel comfortable. Sin is sin. Comfortable. We do this because we don't like to be comfortable. None of us really uh, face the fear of being uh, killed for our faith, but we do face the fear of being affected by the ease and comfort. When you stop fearing... The thoughts and perceptions of men, <clears throat> things change. When you say you don't watch those movies because you, you believe they're not godly, people look at you strange. When you say you don't let your kids play ball because they practice on Sundays and they practice on Wednesdays, and we have very few days of the week that we are able to be involved in church anyway, and so we're not going to do that, they look at you like you're depriving you. When you say you won't do anything, whether it be, I won't let them be involved in this activity because it brings them too far outside our home. Or I won't let them spend the night with you. Another church member who I, I, I kind of know, because you just don't know, you, you want to do everything you can to surround that child, not overprotective, but you want to surround that child with, with a, an air of understanding in the Lord until that child is able to discern for themselves. You're looked at as a We have homeschoolers in here, and I think I think I think it's, there, there's two usually ends up being two brand, uh, strands of homeschools. Uh, hopefully, I'm not either of them. I'm in the middle, but um, they usually ends up being a strand of saying we hate homeschool because you should be in public school. You got to redeem. You, we need to redeem the world. Praise God, we do. And God has called many of you in this room to have children to be in public and private school. Why? Because those kids need to <laughs> see Jesus. 
Jesus in your kids. And you need to be obedient to it. If you do anything else, you've sinned against the holy God. If he's told you that. There's another extreme. Those who that either you hate it or you love it. And you think, oh, you stop loving kids enough. You don't homeschool because you let them be exposed to all that. That's a lie straight from the bits of hell. Whatever it is, you've got to be obedient. Whatever it is, you have to be obedient. But you know what? Both sides look at each other like they are the strangest characters in the world. Fear leads us to fit in and try to worry about what we're perceived by everyone else instead of just saying, i got to stand for what God wants for me. And whether that be public school, private school, home school, boarding school, I think military school is probably the best option, but <laughs> better out by any matters. But whatever it is, that's what we've got to be is obedient. When you say you don't, when you can't buy that new car, because honestly you don't want to strap yourself with a debt that would hinder you from doing what God wants you to do next, you're a weirdo. Why? Wow, because everybody else has got 17 car notes. Everybody else has got, you know, they're, they're up to their, their eyes in debt. And so when you say, I just, don't feel, I just don't feel like I can do it right now because if I did it, and then what if God calls us to do this, I won't have any money to do it. Fear stops us from living lives that are different and just being obedient to the Lord and just being ashamed. We, we want that comfort and ease because we don't want to explain to people why we can't do it because it's much easier. It's hard to tell somebody. And, and honestly, even when you believe this and you truly have this in your heart, it's hard to tell somebody, I really don't think it's okay for me. I'm not, con I'm not condemning you, but it's not okay for me. People don't take it that way, do they? No. I wish they did because it's the truth. But we fear so much that person looking at us and going, oh, you're just trying to be righteous, more righteous than me. And so we'll just back off our own conditions. Fear. Fear of what everybody thinks makes you seek comfort and ease, just like all your neighbors. Because everyone's doing it. We need to remind ourselves that we live godly, moral lives before our family, friends, co-workers, and neighbors. If we do that, we can expect hostility. Because... When our lives of morality line up with next to their lives of immorality, it will be different. Suffering is the inevitable cost of godly living, not comfort and ease. The last thing is that, that fear brings us, brings us to a system of merit. That fear brings us to a system of merit. That's what verse 9 is. It says, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us. Christ Jesus before the ages. Fear stops us from believing that God did it. Fear puts salvation back into our courts. Fear makes us want to earn heaven and earn God's approval and earn that power, earn that love, earn that self-discipline that's only given when we just say it's all you and not me. Fear flips that on its head. Why is this? Because fear is not living in power and love and self-discipline that Jesus gave us. Fear looks for a power source all of its own. Fear seeks love by its own means. Fear tries to discipline itself. Fear leads us away from seeing that everything is all about Jesus. That's why this year as a church we're talking about going all in for Jesus. If you want to live in the power of Him, if you want to live in His love, if you want to live in His self-discipline, it only does it by you saying it's all Him. You've got to have all of me. This is one of the reasons why fear hurts so bad. Because we can never measure up. We can never do enough. We have this feeling of lostness. We have this seeking feeling of unworthiness. All this is a result of fear. And it's not from God. So as I ask Brother Glenn to come forward, I want to just close out by a few things as we kind of, how does this apply to us? How do we look at this? And that, the first one is that today, if you come here with a deep sense of shame, you come here with that shame, um, this is not God's way. God does not desire you to live in this shame. Uh, we're to live in His freedom. We're to live in His joy. We're to live in that power. We're to live in that love. We're to live in that self-discipline that he, he gives. <clears throat> we're to live in that because while we were yet enemies, He died for us. We're not called to live in that shame. 
Not only are we not called to live in that shame, we're not called to, to, to seek that comfort and that ease in our lives. It's going to be difficult. Stop trying to make it where it's supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to. Some of us need to step out of this little bubble of making all our neighbors feel good about us and liking us and just say, this is who I am. If you like this, praise be to God. If you don't, I'm sorry. Jesus does. Stop that. We need to stop that. We need, we need to stop, uh, stop fear from allowing us to be trapped in this system of earning merit from God. Some of you today are just trying. You're so fearful that God's going to hurt you or hurt your children because of your own, your sin. That you're trying to work your way to God. There's no freedom there. There's no power there. There's no love there. There's no self-discipline there. Oh, the only thing is shame. There's nothing there for you. I'm going to ask you to stand here. We close our time. What do you need to put at the altar? Where, what has fear allowed you to do? Have you, have you been trying to earn merit from the Lord? I mean, you need to dump that here and realize it's all Christ and Christ alone. And you've got to be all in for Him. Have you been trying to live a life of comfort and ease? So you've been trying to balance this line on this picket fence of, of, of loving your neighbor but still loving Jesus. So you walk on this fence every day and you don't say things that need to be said because you're just fearful what they'll think of you. You don't want the suffering that comes with that. You want that comfort and ease. Maybe some of you, you just, that shame in general, you need to confess to you. You have, you have been embarrassed of the Lord before men. And you just need to put that at the altar and say, Lord, forgive me. Because the Bible tells us if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Heavenly Father. Maybe that's what you need to do. Whatever you need to do, whether you need to come and say, I want this Jesus you talk about, it's going to change everything. I want him. If you need to do that, please walk. I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you need a church family that you can do this together. Please come.